The Art Dealer Diaries are brought to you by Medicine Man Gallery, located for over 26 years in Tucson, Arizona, specializing in antique Native American art, early Western art, including the famed Maynard Dixon, as well as modern art. You can find everything online at medicinemangallery.com. There's over 6,000 objects to select from. Also, the Charles Bloom Murder Mystery Series, written by yours truly, me, Mark Sublett. There's six books in this series, and they follow the protagonist Charles Bloom through all the intrigue of the art world set in Santa Fe and the Navajo Nation. These can be found on Audible, eBooks, Amazon, and of course, the gallery at medicinemangallery.com. I have Mark Blackburn on today. Oh my God, what a gem he is. We talked about Explorers Club coins uh, being bought at 17 years old for over $160,000 and what it's like to be a dealer and a trader. And if you ever had one of those podcasts that you just didn't need to say a word, well, that was the one for me because I just sat back and listened and Mark was a joy to have on and I highly encourage you to listen to this one. You won't ever hear another podcast quite like this. Wow, I pulled Mark Blackburn out of his booth as the show is opening. He's trying to make money. I said, Mark, you got to come on my podcast, The Art Dealer Diaries. He says, okay, come on. Why not? It's a good break. It's a good break. Mark's one of the busiest active dealers I've ever met, actually, and I've met them all. And uh, he's in a field, he kind of has his own world when it comes, I think, to antiques and uh, Native American art. Most people think of him probably just as a tribal art dealer. Uh, that's what I did, but then I found out, no, it's, he's got a big story to tell, and we're going to see if we can pry some of the things away from him. Um, he lives in uh, basically Honolulu, right? Right, most of the year. In Santa Fe, sometimes. Part of the year, yeah. I have a second home here. Yeah. So what I want to know, Mark, is just let's start at the beginning. Where'd you grow up? Uh, L.A., California. Uh-huh. Uh, raised by very blue-collar middle of the road grandparents. And what did they do? What were he they? worked for the VA yeah. and well, she was a housewife. And so they raised you. Right. And you stayed in LA for how long? Uh, I stayed in LA until I started going on my wanderlust and that was about 14 years old. And so what, tell me what the heck's a wanderlust? Well, I mean, I, I was sort of uh, very non-conventional. You still and, are. By and by 14 years old, I was dealing very heavily in rare coins. And by, the, by 16 years old, I was traveling the world for it. That's so amazing. And I barely graduated high school, for people that want to know. Okay? <laughs> uh, I think you, do, you went to the, hard, the high school of hard knocks. Yes. For learning that. So you, at 14, you start dealing in coins. And how did that happen? Well, it started with my grandfather. One day, he took out a cigar box full of Indian head pennies. And we went to the neighborhood Five and Dime. And I bought one of those Whitman... Blue I had folders, a, yeah. and I started doing it, and then I went to the coin club, and then once I got in, involved in the coin club, I was also involved in Boy Scouts at the time, and one thing led to another, and then my trading spirit just arose. Yeah, it popped out immediately. Yeah. And you kind of knew you, ha- you were a natural trader? Uh, yeah. yeah, and people ask me, what do I do? I'm a trader. Yeah, that's true. That is what we do. I mean, I think some of the best art dealers are able to look at things and say, yeah, I can trade for this or that. You know, I, it's it, about knowing value, recognizing value. That's right. That is exactly. I, I traded a bunch. To, in fact, yesterday I traded a bunch of great jewelry for a great table. Right. Know? So that's what we do. Yeah. I mean, people ask me all the time, what do I do? I'm a trader. And they go, what? <laughs> I trade, I'll trade just about anything. I was a big gold and silver trader. Yeah. You know, I spent 36 years in the Oriental rug business, which people can't actually wrap their head around. Yeah, that's really interesting. I'm going to get into that, too, because I, find, I, find, I can't wrap my head around it because just the way you commuted was crazy. But so when you, at 14, you start buying and selling coins. Right. And so what kind of level of coins were you buying and selling at that well, time? Well, I mean, I started very moderately. I mean, I had no money. So, you know, maybe I had an allowance of five, ten dollars a week, but I was always like trying to make money. Right. And so I probably had the... Uh, yeah, so you had for like a wanted coins, coins kind of thing? Right, no, but I also sold through comic books. And what kind of comic I books? I mean, if you remember the comic books. I collected the back, them. Right, at the back of the comic book sections, you had little like one inch ads. Yeah. So that's what I was running. What year was that? What years were those? Do you remember? 14. Yeah, so I'm going to look at my comic book collection, which I put together when I was about... 
12 to 16. I'm going to see if I see your ads. Yeah, no, and if I, I do, I'm going to send you one of them. All right, because I have none of that stuff in my early years. Yeah. And then it just led from there, and then I just got very bold. I had no boundaries, right? Yeah. I mean, I just like, let's go for it. You know, and I was like very unfocused in school. Yeah. It was like making, I was, you know, like 14 years old, and I'm going like, I'm making more money than my school teacher, right? It sounds really strange, but yeah. I was like, I just had this ambition and I came from very moderate means and grew up in a very small house and, and so just you, went for it. Yeah, and so you, you're doing that for two years and then you go on this wanderlust and you're 16, right? Right. And I bought a first class ticket around the world on Pan Am Airways for $5,000 <laughs> and that changed my life forever. And I'm not even sure if you can fly alone. As, uh, maybe you can fly alone at, at 16, 16 now. Yeah. You could do anything then. They used right, to just... but I mean, it was unusual. I was an unusual kid. Yeah, what was that like being in first class? You're 16, you're in first class. And that's the first, is that the first time you even had flown? No, no, I was flying. Before that, I was flying around the U.S. on the weekends <laughs> to go to coin shows. So I'd look in the coin, uh, you know, the, uh, the coin journals, right? Yeah. And... Uh, coin dealer newsletter or whether it be, you know, the coin papers and stuff like that. And there might be two shows. So it would be like Sioux City, Iowa, and maybe Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. So I'd buy a ticket. I could like one show, hit that show for a few hours, then get the next <laughs> plane out and go to the next one. And so that I did that for years and years and years. So I would go and I would buy coins and sell coins. And of course, you know, I was really young and people got, said to, somebody said to me the other day, why, why were you so successful? I'll tell you one of the reasons I was successful is that great eyes. Yeah. That because makes when you're different. young, you know, and this is the days before we had slab coins and what we call today raw coins. Right. And uh, so, you know, I had an advantage, very sharp eyes, and it's all about grading and coins. Yeah, and you had young eyes, too. Right, really you. young eyes. And then I started going to Europe a lot, and that's where I started making a lot of money because they were on the old uh, conservative English grading system. So a coin could be very fine or extremely fine and had tarnish on it, like a little discoloration, yet actually it was mint state. So I recognized the value there, and so I was going back and forth to Europe all the time, and especially England, like T.D. Puddock, 123 New Bond Street, Olympia Coin Fairs, I'd buy really early U.S. coins, and then I got on the thing, and I figured, well, why not take rare European coins back? Right. So I did it, like, sort of two-way, and I did this for years. So years. you started learning about the rare coins of Europe, right. too. But I also emboldened myself, because, I mean, I, I have a sixth sense, and it's not an ego thing, it's just I, I have a sixth sense of value. Yeah. Because I have many people in my life right now ask me, how, what do you know? What, how do you know what you're doing? I said, you know, you can't read it in a book. And you and I are both traders. So you walk into a show and you see something amazing. You go, wow, that's really beautiful or great. And you have a subjective value in your head. You just go for it. Because, yep. I mean, we don't have a book that we can look this stuff up in. Yeah. And rare coins, we did, actually. Yeah, and that became more and more transparent as time went on. But right. when you were in there, it was before slabbing, and so you really had an advantage if you could understand the grading system and all the values, which you were getting it because you're running all around the country. Right. So you see it from all angles. And so it was like, you know, I was specializing in certain areas. Yeah, like what areas? Well, I mean, I was really loved early American coinage. Colonial coinage, I was really into, because I'm a historical guy. I love history. Right. And so, you know, you can teach me in school, but I'd rather actually hold the stuff in my hands. I mean, this is 18th century history of America, you yeah. know? So it was pretty special. And I actually, probably one of the first to really buy and sell colonial coinage and colonial tokens, because I realized, man, this is American history in your hands. Yeah. And rare. Right. And then that led me later on to buy the ultimate early American coin, which is the 1804 silver dollar. Yeah, tell us about that. We're there. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I was pretty young and emboldened. How old and, is young? How old were you? Uh, when I bought that coin, I'd have to look up maybe 17. Okay, so you're a 17-year-old kid. You've gone first class Pan Am to Europe. You spent time there, and then you find this coin? Well, it was everybody knew the coin. It was with yeah. uh, Bowers and Ruddy, which was the biggest rare coin dealership in the world. Okay. And they had it for sale, and it's like the rarest coin in the world, right, at the time. The ultimate coin. <laughs> and so I went to uh, Dave Bowers, who always had a soft spot for me, very prim and proper type guy. And here's this kid. I remember... That particular day, I was wearing a Mickey Mouse t-shirt and jeans, and I went to David Powers, and I said, so how much do you sell me the 1804 silver dollar for? 
And he goes, really, Mark? I go, yeah. Huh? He says, I want a, I have 175000 on it. I'll sell it to you for $167,500, which was huge money then. Oh, huge. huge. Yeah, no. Like mega money. And so within like 30 seconds, I said, okay, I'll take it. And then I sold it the next day. Had you paid him for the 167? Yeah, I did. I you did had the money. Him, you you know? done so, so I mean, well. you know, but it was a stretch. And, uh, you know, I was buying and selling a lot of coins. And you want to share what you sold it for? Yeah, well, it's public record. You can look it up. I mean, I sold it for $225,000 the next day. <laughs> now what's that worth? Though? The Richard Martinson in uh, Minneapolis. So it's worth many, many, many millions of dollars yeah. today. And actually, somebody pointed out the other day, oh, I saw your name on it. It's like, yeah, it's part of the provenance. But I was very young. And so, now that coin, talk about an investment. I mean, yeah. Not a bad investment. And so how did you know to go do that? I mean, did you have a buyer for it? Or no. was it strictly gut? No, strictly gut. And you can't explain it. I mean, people always want to define me. I mean, every almost every day I could ask, well, how do you do this? How do you know? It's just something you're born with. Yeah. You know, and I took, by the way, that type of trading skills of what took me into the Oriental rug business. Yeah, which I want to find out about. But I do want to know what did that dealer do, this prom and proper individual, when you said, I'll take it? He was like totally normal because I did deals with him before. So he by the him. way, that particular dealer was, is the greatest dealer alive. He's still, you know, kicking. And, uh, we had something very much in common years later that we collected postcards together. I had 53,000 postcards in my collection, but that's another thing. Yeah, that's the collection you just donated. Right, donated to, right, to Los right? Angeles County Museum of Art. It was 53,000 postcards of Polynesia before 1920. And, and that, actually, I just want to say something. Uh, I was given so much grief for collecting those postcards, and now they become a major, major, major thing. In fact, Nicole Paducey made four trips from Switzerland to view the collection, and she did her PhD on it. So 53, a, and 53,000, right. right? But she's specialized in Fiji. But and anyway. they also put it about, they're putting them up online, right? right? As All a those, resource, right? The, one of the, one of the uh, things that I really love about Michael Govan, who's the director of LACMA, and Nancy Thomas, I'll give them a plug. I consider them very close friends, very inspirational for me, is that... When Michael was at the house, I said to him, okay, you can have it, but we gotta make it open sourced. Because one of the problems with museums today is that a scholar, a student does not have access. Uh, like Bishop Museum in Honolulu, don't put me on the record, but it's like several on the hundred dollars, right now. <laughs> several hundred dollars to borrow an image. Yeah. And so now all these photographs I get, uh, gifted to LACMA will go online and there'll be uh, interaction you know, you could interact with yeah, them. Yeah, you can download so, and right. get the information. So, but yeah. also, if you have, a, you know, if, uh, if somebody sees their auntie on there, yeah. they'll be able to say, hey, that's Auntie Harriet or something. So it's pretty cool. And that, how long did it take you to put together 53,000 postcards? I went to every postcard show or whatever, anywhere I was, a long time. I mean, that was a collection of probably 30 plus years. And, you know, I really love postcards. I, and actually, you know what? I still buy postcards. I was going to say, I'm, I'm sure I mean, you're still buying. Sort, of sort of like, uh, you know, an addict on that. But what? they're great uh, historical artifacts. Yeah, what's the rarest postcard? Because I don't have any sense of value. Well, I bought something. the rarest postcard was a postcard I bought at the York Postcard Show maybe 10 years ago. I paid $5,000 for it. But it was a Pioneer card, a blue back card, the first postcard ever, uh, you know, produced in mm. Hawaii. But I mean, you're, that's almost, it's not a historical artifact. I like them for their representations, the photographic images. That's more of like a collector's thing, like a coin or a stamp. You know? Yeah. And that kind of set you apart because you had done coins and you could also grade postcards similarly. Right. I did stamps. I've done, you know, everything. I mean, I could still buy and sell stamps if I wanted to. So, uh, or coins, I'm sure, yeah, as well. I so still, you sell this coin for 225000 You're 17 years old. Then what do you do? I just keep on buying and selling, you know? So, I mean, that's what I did. And In Europe? Or yeah, you... Europe and the U.S. And so it became a very big deal. And uh, I was going to Europe almost every week. And then I was the first one to numismatically search the Swiss banks, which was a huge breakthrough for me. And that was just pure dumb luck. Tell me about that. Well, I, I don't want to go on the record, but I was... Well, you're on the record, I, I, so I, don't, I, don't tell say me. about I this about <laughs> who backed me, but... Yeah. Two very famous people in the world backed me as a kid. 
And one of those people, I had the guts enough to stop and talk to him in first class in United Airlines. And I said, I hear you buy this type of thing. I said, yeah, kid, okay. Anyway, he later backed me. And so I would go to Switzerland and buy raw coins. Now, gold was $36 an ounce then. So you could buy a US $20 gold piece for $38. So the buy was like 36, sell for 38. Yeah. So I bought huge amounts of 20s or 10s or whatever, and they're for bullion, yes. for a very little premium. And so when I started buying them, I realized, oh my God, this is a rare Carson City US $20 gold piece. Yeah. It's not worth $38, it's worth $600. Yeah. So I sort of put two and two together and realized that the Swiss banks had never been numismatically searched yet on their upper floors, they had a numismatic department. So because I had no boundaries, I had uh, <laughs> I got the young girls behind the cages to start, you know, let me look through the coins. And so, I mean, it was like just, honestly, it was free money. And it was like revolutionary. And I was so emboldened that <laughs> one day on Bonhoeffstrasse, a certain Swiss bank, I went downstairs and bought a, uh, coin, right, a gold coin, a bunch of gold coins. I, and the rare ones I took upstairs and sold to a numismatic department. So, I mean, that was sort of crazy. <laughs> Going know? downstairs and selling upstairs? Right, they own the coins. So anyway, but it's, you know, you could, the thing about this is that you could never do that today. I mean, the opportunities were so amazing. And it was just like, I don't know, I always tell people that between the age of 14 and 21, I sort of lived a rock star life because you could make money, you had, you know, no boundaries, right? And it was just an amazing age, right? And, I, and yes, I was totally full of myself. For those of you that remember my 21st birthday party, yes, I was full of myself, right? <laughs> sort of legendary. I've, I've become much more mellow today. Yeah, well, you've had experience, you understand. Right. Yeah, and that ha and you've had your own child, and that really makes a difference when you right, see right. how that is. I mean, Dr. Kuhani, at three days old, he's Tahitian, and that sort of leveled me out. Although I was leveled up, you know, my, yeah. my teens to my, after somebody asked me the other day, did you change your life after that 21st birthday party? Yes, I did. Because I realized I just had a flash, and it was like, really? I just figured out everything that needed to be known on that particular evening. Yeah, you did what you needed to do, and you could see the future coming, right, and it right, was a different right. future. Yeah, and so I just worked really, really hard, and, you know, then took coins. I've always bought and sold coins. I still today, right here in Santa Fe, I buy coins from your coin dealer right on Cerritos Road, Yeah. right? So it's like, it's something I will always do the day I die. And people don't really realize this, but people go, you still collect coins? Yeah, I do. I collect, I've collected privately. Nobody even knows I do it except a few dealers. Ancient Greek, silver and gold coinage, preferably in the fifth century, or say third century before, but from the you know, uh, stylistic viewpoint, it's got to be sculpture. Because I look at them as miniature sculptures. Yeah, I could see that. And that was like, the only other person that actually realized that early on was Sheikh Althani. And he was like really into it. And so I had a lot of competition from him. Of course, he never paid for the coins and now he's no longer alive. But it was interesting times. So. Yeah, and if anybody's out there that has those coins, contact Mark Blackburn. He's the right. guy. I, want, I, don't care about the, I don't care about where they were minted. But I'm clear about the portraiture. They're, they are miniature sculptures. Yeah. And imagine each one's handed, pounded out by hand. So yeah. they're quite, you know, when you hold one of those, I, I ran an ad a long time ago at 21 years old. I said, hold history in your hands, right? Love that. You hold a, you hold a coin from the 5th century. It's something special. Yeah, how many hands touch it? Right. How and many you think transactions about, you know, And then I'll make a through. philosophical point. Yeah. I always say that humankind had a, all figured out by the fifth century, the Greeks had it figured out. It's been downhill ever since, <laughs> right? Hold it in your hand. So you, so now, what's the next step? Because we, you know, most people know you as this um, upper tier dealer in tribal Polynesian oceanic art. So somehow you ended up in Hawaii, right? And how did you end up in Hawaii? Well, I mean, in 1971, I just lost a great deal of money, and I wanted to start over. And so me and my girlfriend came to Hawaii, and she sold suntan lotion on the beach, right? And <laughs> I started hustling. And so I started running the first buy ads in all the outer islands. And, uh, you know, I, I ran buy ads all over the U.S. where I'd go into town, I'd buy 
buying gold and silver, blah, blah, blah. I'd be here for three days only in my hotel room. I was one that actually, I will say this on record. I'm the one that originated that. Oh, that was really hotel. my personal thought. And so I used to run all over the U.S. and run these buy ads. So, and you would do them all yourself? Or to yeah, those? yeah. No, I'd have a couple of staff people yeah. with me, and they'd hold people to like line up. Out. I mean, those were the glory days. People would line up 20 deep to sell you stuff, right? Yeah. And so it was really interesting. I was only buying uh, gold, silver, coins, some antiques off those ads. And then people started bringing in artifacts. And then I was a quick learn on Hawaiian artifacts. But, you know. And this my, is 71? Yeah. And so then I started getting into that. And then I, you know, I had traveled previously to New Zealand. And New Zealand really was my, it's probably one of the most spiritual places in the world for me. And uh, I really was engrossed by the Polynesian cult uh, culture along with Tahiti. And uh, that's really, you know, I bought my first Polynesian object on that, on that round the world trip. When you were a kid? Yeah, yeah, I bought it in a Hamburg flea market because I thought, wow, I just saw one of these. It was a Maori hei tiki, you know, it was pretty oh, yeah. crazy. <laughs> so that's sort of, you know, where I got started. I got really the bug. And people say, well, why'd you go to Hawaii first? I went to Hawaii because of, I was young. Huh? Hawaii Five O was on. Yeah. Jack Lord was a personal friend. It was pretty cool, right? And I became, you know, enamored. It was very romantic. I mean, people have no idea Still what is. Hawaii was like then. Oh, I can only imagine. Or and, like Tahiti. And did you go right to Honolulu when you were in? Yeah, yeah, I went yeah. to Honolulu. But I'd been to Honolulu on this trip around the world. So when Honolulu, Papiete, Morea had an incredible time at Tahiti. Ended up going to. The next stop was Auckland, and then I just really fell in love. I mean, Tahiti, my God, is one of the most beautiful places. This is like 71? Yeah, I mean, I was on Bora Bora, and yeah. Maria, I was a young kid. So you're getting exposed, you're starting to understand the culture and the history, you're probably absorbing all that as it goes around, right? Right, right. And so at what point did you go, I'm staying here, this is going to be home base from now on? Well, what happened in 71, I was there for the first time, and then I was still very heavily in the coin business. And so I go back and forth, right? And back and the, forth to Europe and the United yeah, States. And then, you know, I was based in California. Yeah. And then it would be in 1976 that I ended up in Hawaii, basically full time. And uh, that's where I started, you know, doing the Hawaiian thing. And then chronologically, then I, after a certain amount of years, I realized, you know what? Hawaii is so stacked. I mean, it's very hard to get ahead. So I decided to go to Santa Fe. And people don't really realize that I came here and actually had that building between the pink adobe and the bull ring. So right. it was an early, I had an early gallery. What year was that? That would be in the early 80s. Yeah, which was really a prime time. Oh in my Santa God, Fe. it was cr prime. crazy. And so at that time, we had a clothing store right between the pink adobe and the bull ring. And then I started uh, moving Carolyn out of that and then started putting objects and whatever and those were glory days and what really made it for us was we, the kindness of Rosalie from the Pink Adobe she mm -hmm. was a legend and she liked us so much that she would send her overflow, overflow people and this was the greatest restaurant in the world at yeah, the time it, it was, was the first time that I ever came in contact with private jets flying in for dinner yeah. and so it was pretty it was a very special magical time uh, I'm, I mean, I'm not, Santa Fe has become more like fantasy here. And it was like Santa Fe then was very, very, very different and very special. But so was most of the world. I mean, Honolulu was a totally different yeah. place. And for you, dealing in art at that time, it was just being found and people were exploding and it was a great time. And right. so you started dealing in textiles, oriental right textiles there. at that so, point. So uh, a certain person in this town... Yeah by the name of Ira Serrett, started me in carpets, but I'd already been, you know, I'd been exposed to carpets, and I realized that I could turn them into a commodity. I mean, I'm, you know, Ira and I sort of still get along, although Ira, if you're listening, you're lucky I don't come back here, because <laughs> don't forget it, my, my whole thing was I guaranteed the lowest price in the U.S. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, his, in, you know, doing business with him, and then spending time overseas and realizing this carpet is $10,000, this carpet is $5,000, oh my God, this carpet is 1800 and realizing they're all the same carpet. Yeah. And then I sort of turned it into a commodity. And you, you would go to the source to collect these right, things too, right? right? Where so, would you go? Uh, Pakistan, India, Turkey, China, 
Iran, Afghanistan. So I spent, you know, 36 years in that, and people don't really understand because I, mean, I was exposed in all these conflict zones, and that's why maybe it's made me such a political animal today because I realize what humankind faces right now. Yeah, those were dangerous places. No, they you know, are right, dangerous. Right? Did places. you have to go with bodyguards yeah. and that kind of thing? Yeah. And so it was pretty amazing to spend that amount of time in that area. But it also opened my eyes up to radical Islam for the first time. In the 90s, I saw it spreading. And uh, I mean, the northern Swat Valley, one of the most beautiful places on the planet, where it's just devastated by that. And so I saw this early on, I sort of saw what was coming on, but it was an interesting business and I spent 36 years and, and, and used to write a column for Architectural Digest and I could buy and sell rugs in my sleep, although I don't do it hardly at all anymore. <laughs> and people are always like, you want to go back and do this? No, I'm not interested. And that market has changed dramatically. Oh my God, it's yeah. totally changed because people are in denial. The problem with our business, a lot of people are in denial. It's generational. And the people that really appreciated handmade, beautiful rugs that were labor intense and the work of art for the floor, most of them are not living anymore. Yeah. And the younger, my son's generation, uh, you know, millennial generation, Generation X, they, they don't care. You know, it's about disposable stuff and about electronics. And that's one of the reasons I want to do this podcast is to get those generations to at least look and absorb this material and realize that there's a value to being handmade, having history, and to have something besides just something you go get at, uh, you know, Ikea. Right. I mean, imagine this. Imagine a handmade oriental rug, room size. It takes two to three people almost a year to produce. As Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe said, I mean, the soul of the apartment is the carpet. Mm -hmm. And... One of my big things, what I wrote for Architectural Digest or when I did that book, Oriental Rug, Secrets Revealed, is to try and show the public. I mean, this is a tremendous ancient art form. Yeah. And to have it in your house, it's pretty special. And it can last for generations. No, I mean, it lasts generations. Yeah. I mean, you know, you pass down handmade, or, handmade Oriental Rugs. It sounds like a spiel like I used to get, but, yeah. it's, but it's the truth. Yeah, truth. no, it's the truth. I mean, the same with the Navajos, which I did. Right, like. I mean, the Navajo rugs, people don't really get it. They look at the rug, they don't really realize the work, or, or you know, imagine the people working on that rug every day. Their outside. lives, and outside. Raising and, the and, sheep, you know, shearing and, the right, sheep. Right, the whole process. Yeah. I mean, just wool itself's incredible. Yeah. And, and, just they have dying. A, and they have a religious sensibility to it as well. And it's how they make their living. And there's still, luckily, great weavers out there that are still weaving, still making it. You know, I think some areas like the Southwest, uh, it's still embraced. But you're right. I think Oriental rugs especially have changed dramatically. It seems like when I talk to like a David Adler who we had on the podcast who, you know, says these are And things. people say, I mean, I'll go on the record and say this because people don't want to hear it. But I mean, you know. That rug business is never coming back because it's a generational thing. And, you know, that, that generation's gone. And that's why I'm so concerned about that's, you know, people give me a hard time because I write that on trend uh, thing for Atata, but, you know, I'm a realist. Yeah. You know, the market's different today. People you look at to, objects differently. You have and, to look at them differently. There's no doubt about it. The question is um, sometimes they uh, jump generations too. So this generation may not have interest, but the next might. You know, you look at the kids today that are interested in vinyl records and, you know, things that are, you, that, you know, we don't even care about. So we, I think some stuff comes back. Yeah, I think so. But it's true. It's a, it's a general, generational change. That's one of the reasons we do things like podcasts that get out there to different groups and expose. You just don't know if you can expose enough people that at some point they may go, Hmm, I can get this rug, this Navajo or Oriental rug that was 100 years old for as much or even maybe less than a commercially made thing that's no good in a year. Right, that's sold at Ikea. Yeah. And, and you know, the thing is, I try and instill with everybody, you look at these things as just like, well, that's a carpet. No, that's somebody's life, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and just the stories that are involved in any type of carpet or any type of weaving or yeah. any type of sculpture. I mean, you're just traveling back in time and somebody's mind. Imagine all the challenges and highs and lows yeah. those people had every day. That's right. Family, you, know? you, can, you can see the children being born as they do the rugs. Right. You can see that things progress. Yeah, I agree. Um, and you did that for a very long time. You did it for how many years? 36 years. 36 years. And so when did you flip? from being an oriental rug dealer. And you also had your own plant, right? right. It was a different thing. Well, I no, I mean, I had, what I was doing is like I had 
contracts with weavers yeah. and you know what we're doing our own thing there but i also then got into some commercial stuff like braided rugs i realized there was a big market for braided rugs which are commercially made in the u.s so i own braidedrugs.com did a lot of online business and you had your own business in pennsylvania your own textile right, right. business right on lincoln highway and was there for 36 years at a warehouse and a showroom and people always go like why lancaster pennsylvania because it was within one hour to three hours of every major East Coast city. And it was untouched, really. Right, and time. it was the seventh largest tourist attraction. I remember my attorney, who thought it was totally crazy, going out into a cow pasture on Lincoln Highway and going, what? You're going to pay this, or you're going to lease this, or what are you going to do here? You don't, I mean, what, out in a cow pasture? Well, that cow pasture turned out to be one of the largest uh, outlet shopping areas in the U.S. Yeah. And at that time, uh, you know, Witness had come out a couple years later. So Lancaster County was the seventh largest tourist attraction in the U.S. And so you went from Santa Fe to Lancaster and um, and you did it because you saw something there, an opportunity. It was a long term opportunity, but you right, saw right. it. I was I was basically a geographical thing, too. You had this market. OK, you had New York, Baltimore, D.C., Philly, yeah. Boston, and they all came down to see the Amish. And people said, this is never going to work. Well, it did work. <laughs> and, you know, I just, one of my big uh, taglines is, we guarantee the lowest handmade rug prices in the U.S. Yeah. And so, you know, it was a commodity. Yeah. But I, people say, you were a rug dealer? Yes, an industrial quantity. Oh, no, no. Yeah, on an industrial level. And so, how, and were you having to commute to do that? Oh, I, yeah, I was traveling yeah. all over. And the same time, 19... I guess it was 1992, we adopted Kuhani, and then I decided, look, I want to raise Kuhani in Hawaii because there's so much racial prejudice, and he's brown-skinned, and yep. even in a waspy town like Lancaster, I could tell you stories, and so we raised him in, uh, in Hawaii, and then I would commute, I mean, the newspapers did a story of me once saying I was the longest commuter to work. So, you know, I have a lot of air miles. People say, how can you do it? I can do it because you, guess what? Nobody can call me. Yeah. I mean, but now we have internet. So, you know, it's like a good text. But anyway, so, there's sort of some peacefulness in this. So you would fly from Honolulu to where? Philadelphia? or I'd fly to Newark. Yeah. And Sometimes you would, I would fly to Harrisburg. And how often did you do that? Oh, God. No. Every week? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Every I mean, week you're going back and And then forth. I would be overseas. And then I was like... At those particular times, and I was in, I was a, a fixture in every auction, yeah, in the UK or Paris. So I mean, I was living, you know, I was I was constantly on planes. Yeah, well, you still are because I I know last year at this show I was looking for you, and they said, oh, he went back to Honolulu for something. I think One, I went back for twelve hours to to because I got an invite from the New Zealand government to. Uh, had the introduction of Scott Ambassador Scott Brown. So I yeah. flew back for 12 hours to you know, go to this reception for Scott Brown. I remember hearing that and thinking, my God, this guy is crazy. He no, but the year yeah. before, I, I went to Hong Kong from, uh, from Santa Fe, what, for three days, the jury art contest in Hong Kong. And then came back for the show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Actually, I came off the plane yeah. and went to Albuquerque to the, you know, I love that. I love... Uh, they're showing out. Yeah, Terry Schumacher. Yeah, Terry show. shows the best, yeah. right, for, for discovery. Yeah. And so you came back and you did that. And I think I will say this, and I think it's one of the reasons you're successful. You have the eye, you have that. But you also have a drivenness. And you have to have that drive of wanting to go, 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 you know, never stop. Without that, really, I don't think you get to that next level. No, I mean, I've been accused of that. My son tells me that. I mean, you know, I don't stay still. Yeah. I mean, I can. That's who you are. I mean, I, as you saw in the house in Honolulu, I have this massive library. Yeah. And yeah, I let's talk a, about that. You I have a, a fantastic a, library. You know, I have the largest, largest, probably one of the largest in the world, even libraries counted, on Polynesia. And then I have art history. And then I have philosophy. And people don't realize, I mean, they think they can get everything from the internet, but that's not true. I mean, there's a lot of these books that are one-offs. No, no, like in Polynesia, especially Maori subjects, or even Central Polynesia. So I spent a lifetime collecting for that library. And people are always amazed when I take them downstairs. They go, oh my God. I was. I mean, how many people have a library? I don't know. So I not found like great, that. you know, and so, you know, I do find great solace in books, being around great books or just books in general and objects. 
I mean, they're very settling. You know? And it also allows you to find things like the cook thing that you Right. I mean, you know, you just got to have a, you know, I, if somebody asked me and I was not here anymore, I want to be remembered for having a sense of curiosity, right? Very few people I know have passion for cur- or yeah. curiosity. Yeah. I mean, there's always so, more, so much more to learn in every area. And that's what gets me up in the morning. And I want to make a statement on that. Yeah, do. Because it's very interesting. I'm told time after time after time again, oh, it must be nice to be an expert. I go, there's no such thing as an expert. As I learn something new every day. Yeah. That's it. You know, it's funny you bring this up because my goal every day is to try to learn something new. Right. I that's mean, it's it. fine. I, I mean, mean, I've said that for that's, decades. That's what you get out of bed for. Yeah. And see, some people, one of the, the saddest things I see in people is there's no passion for life or for exploring things or learning. I mean, just the, just want to learn something new every day. I mean, this is an amazing planet we live in. Yeah. And you can connect the dots through art, through history, right. through people, through history. ethnicity, through culture. And, um, and you did that with Polynesian art. And I want to touch on that because you have such a great knowledge. It is really, I was blown away. You know, I collect, you know, some things, but, right. you know, it's just a passion. I like for I've sold you a few bowls. You have, you have. <laughs> One of the greatest bowls I have actually came through you, and it sits in my house, and I, and I treasure it greatly. And, but how did you get to that level of uh, knowledge and, um, and doing it, how you well, did it? I, I mean, it's very, amazing. Well, I was very, 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 very lucky that I had great mentors. And because I didn't have any boundaries, right? And mm-hmm. I still don't have boundaries, really. Is I, I will go up and talk to people like great academics. And in every instance, whether it be Terrence Barrow, whether it be Dr. Uh, Skinner, whether it be David Simmons, who I did that documentary with, Georgia Lee, Thor Heyerdahl, right? All these great ones today, Steve Hooper, my adoptive mother, Adrian Kepler, who did our book, a Beautiful book, Van by Dilbert, the way. It's just a gorgeous book. And all way. these things. And for some reason, I've been blessed by having these people in my life on a one-on-one where I just download the stuff. And it's like Dave Simmons, when we did that documentary before he passed away, which is a really weird deal, like we did it just like six months before. I used to tell David, I said, you know, I wish I could put one of these like a chip or something in your head and download everything you have in your mind. Yeah. Because that's what the problem is. All these people, when they're gone, they have so many great stories to tell. Yes. And it's a lost knowledge. And we're losing knowledge. I mean, you know, Roger Nietzsche and Dave Simmons and Terry Barrow were the greatest scholars in the world on Maori art. Mm-hmm. I knew every one of them very closely, very intimately. And a great privilege. So if people say, well, you know so much about this and whatever, I've been mentored by Maui Palmari, the king of the Maoris, yeah. a close friend of mine, you know, and I mean, spent lots of special times in Wellington with him. So, and, you, and you've done books and things too. I, I mean, you have done a lot of your own. Yeah, seven books. But yeah. I mean, you know, I, I did books uh, sort of early on. I mean, you know, people, I mean, one of the craziest books I did was Hawaiiana, the best of Hawaiian design, because I was approached by a publisher and I said, you know, people always thought like I collect kitsch. I don't, you've been in the house. I don't collect kitsch. There's but, no kitsch. You know, so <laughs> the only thing good about that book is I coined the term Hawaiiana, which is not a big deal. Wow. I and didn't so know that. So that went into yeah. two editions. It's like popular culture Hawaiian stuff. And now that transformed the whole tourist market and everything. So I was the first one to like really pay attention to mats and menus or travel posters or Ming's jewelry or Aloha shirts and all that type of stuff. But my best selling and best received book was my book on tattoos. And that's a funny story because my publisher approached me to do a book on tattoos and he's very, very nervous about it. And this is the 90s. So uh, I did a book called you know, Tattoos from Paradise, Traditional Polynesian Patterns. And he was very nervous. He goes, I don't think this is going to sell, but I'll still do it. You know? So at the time, at the uh, American uh, Museum of Natural History in New York, we did a body art show. I think it was 1999. Mm-hmm. And I went up there with my publisher, and he couldn't believe it. It's like, oh my God, this body art show and tattoo played a big part of it. Well, to cut to the chase, after my first book, he did over 200 books on tattoo. Wow. And I took him to Roseland that night, and I signed books and stuff, and I was on MTV. So, you know, today I still get maybe one two inquiries a month off that book, like what type of tattoo should I put on? And 
I have to say that I did that MTV thing at the time, and so I was on there on MTV, and they go, so Mark, where's your tattoos? I, was, well, I, was I have no you. tattoos. <laughs> that was my question. Right? I, I, I believe, and personally believe, that, you know, I mean, I have a very strong personal belief that Polynesian tattoos belong on Polynesian people. But uh, anyway, no tattoos. No, I'm not interested in getting a tattoo. But anyway. And what interested you to, to do tattoos? The artwork? Or the history the, and the, the artwork. I mean, you know, the word comes from tattoo. I mean, all tattoo comes from Polynesia. Yeah. I mean, so yet it's such a popular culture, and it's very interesting looking at it philosophically. Yeah, they're beautiful. People, and... I mean, people still to this day, there's, you know, a stigma attached to getting a tattoo. And so most people think, oh, tattoos, that's a bad boy, a bad girl, right? And so now it's a lot more mainstream. Yeah, that's very interesting. I had no idea. See, I learned something. I have curiosity. But well, that's to where something. tattoo came from, Polynesia, yeah. right? Yeah, that, and I, that, the first sailors were the ones, you know. In yeah. fact, there was a, a, a particular person in the early 1800s had himself completely tattooed, came back to England, went on the circuit. You know, yeah, I'm sure. They were living. Yeah, so. I can imagine. And they have a, some beautiful uh, artifacts that the bishops I've seen on tattoos as you first come in off to the right there right. in the main I hall. I mean, Marquesan tattoo, I think, is probably the most beautiful. Yeah, it's, that's wild. And then... They what, did lots of facial. Right. I mean, yeah. and Moko from, and, you know, face tattoo and buttock tattoo from the Maori. Mm -hmm. And then even people don't realize the Hawaiian tattoos were a big thing. And I want to stop and tell you an interesting story on Hawaiian tattoos because... In the 90s, I went and was very connected in France. And so I was able to buy uh, all the artifacts that were collected by Admiral Tupititoire and passed down through the family when they, when they took and took the Marquesas Islands. So because of that, and because of this very important sort of uh, royal family in France, they turned me on to another noble family in France. And these were descendants of Freycinet. And, Admiral Freycinet from the voyage of the Irani in 1819. And so, long story short, this could be a whole podcast on its own, but I found the original drawings setting in the Loire Valley in France. And they'd not been looked at since 1819. They'd been exhibited once. And so, I bought the 43 drawings. And uh, I remember you talking about They're really about important because it changed the Hawaiian culture forever because Native Hawaiian people, who I totally support, have a soft spot in my heart for. They didn't know what their tattoos looked like. And so this changed because almost every image had tattoos. So and this was 1819. Right. Just at the time Kamehameha I had died. So it was a really pivotal time, a time of upheaval. In fact, a lot of the uh, tattoos depicted were, uh, you know, Tamehameha on the arm and stuff like that. Those ended up with uh, you know, the Academy of Arts at the time. Patches, Damon Holt put the money up to acquire them. I paid a lot of money for them. I bought and sold them for the same price, just for the record, but I kept the three most important images from my own collection. Yeah, that's wonderful. God. So did your heart just start racing when you saw the, the books, the images? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, now, now I see native Hawaiian people and they're, they're putting on the proper tattoos. And, now and it's have, coming directly from that right, exposure? Right, coming from, that, from the phrase and the images. Race mm -hmm. in Arago, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's you know? really interesting. I mean, it's like when I was in Tonga. You know, when I did that exhibit in Tonga in 1998, I will go on the first. I will go on the record and say I'm the first person to ever le lend back to an indigenous culture in the whole. And so I was approached by Adrian Kepler and Princess Pilalevu of Tonga to open a museum in Tonga for the king's 80th birthday. It was quite an experience. It was like once in a lifetime experience. And it was called from the Stone Age to the Space Age in 200 years. So we started this museum. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of grief. People go, you know what? Your objects are never going to come back. Now, listen, that's a kingdom. Even though it was indemnified by the State Department, it was still a kingdom. I mean, the, the king could have said, okay, these things stay here. Yes. But I lent, lent them for almost one year. And so, but it was very rewarding because within the 24 hours of opening, going down to the marketplace, people were carving their original objects back again. Oh. In fact, Puhani was given a, a Tonga goddess figure, first one ever carved in 200 years. So now that lost knowledge is back with, with them. Yeah, and that's important. And it's to be quite able rewarding. To, yes, know? that's super rewarding. And so I can personally say we changed the, the culture in Tonga forever in a good way. And to this day, I'm very friendly. And I just, I won't name drop, but I had the queen... 
at my house one year ago, almost today, for dinner with two ladies in waiting. So, I mean, I consider the royal family of Tonga very close friends. And uh, if, you have, if you want to go somewhere great in the world, <laughs> go to Tonga. There's 161 islands and, and basically unexplored. And you want, you, know, you want to dive, you want to surf, I mean, that is the place. There are no crowds. Go up in Hapai or Vava'u or something. And that's another like that. aspect that people may not know about you being an explorer, too. Right. Yeah, I mean, you've done some pretty interesting things, like flying into a volcano. Right. So if you ask me, one of the highlights of my life is actually being an Explorers Club member. It's very rarefied air. Not many people get in this club. I'm very honored to be in it and very humble to be in it. And now actually I'm the vice president of the Explorers Club in Honolulu, we actually have, we're, we're sanctioned so we could have a branch. And so, you know, in the Explorers Club, you can't just like go, well, you know, I traveled my lifetime, I was a rug dealer up in Afghanistan. Right. That doesn't fly. You've got to do something notable and you have to have some type of academic background. Well, I'm not an academic. I graduated high school. I don't, I, I never went to college. I don't have a PhD, whatever. So what I did in, after, uh, the king's birthday, it was so crazy in, in Nukalofa, you could, you know, crazy. I mean, it's like every dignitary was there. I just had to get out of there. So, <clears throat> so I found this bush plane pilot who had a medevac contract for the kingdom. And he said, fly me out of here. And he flew me out up to Hapai to a place called Sandy Beach, magical place. And stayed there for like a week. And then I said, you know, can you fly me over to Tofua? And Tofu is this active volcano where Mutiny and the Bounty took the place off of. And I'm a big Mutiny and the Bounty guy. I have a lot of artifacts from Bly and whatever. So to make a long story short on that, I flew over the crater with Kuhane and Carolyn. And then about a year later, I called him up. He thought I was crazy. And I go, you know what? I want to go. I want your plane for 12 days. Every day, wherever you go, I want you to go. Right? And he says, you're crazy. I said, I'm going to bring the surfboard, some scuba gear. I got a you know, sleeping bag. And I said, you know what? I want to land in the hot water lake of Kotofua. And he says, nobody's ever done that. I <laughs> said, well, you're a bush pilot. Man, you can land that plane in this yeah. hot water lake. And he says, Mark, that's crazy. You know? And he goes, but for money, I'll do it. Right? <laughs> so I was in all these small islands, really magical. I dive in you know, reefs that nobody's ever dove on or surf waves. Nobody could ever. It was very rarefied. I mean, in Mongo Island, I went to Mongo Island because that's where the traditional, the most beautiful fish hook in the world's made is Mongo Island, these lures. Yes. And so I just wanted to find out if there was any left there and whatever. So anyone went there, I, it was like I was cook. They came out, greeting me in a dugout canoe. And I mean, it's quite like this guy going back in the 18th century. I wanted a small kava house. I mean, it was crazy. But anyway, that was a really remarkable trip. So I made him land in Tofua. And I had a Tongan with me because the Tongan was like sort of my guy and he was a really cool guy and whatever. So I needed somebody that could speak Tongan. So we landed in the lake. It was very, very, very difficult. And it was a hot water lake. Yeah. What was the temperature? I like 100 and probably 20 or something. Wow. Yeah, that so it was hot. hot. Yeah. And so we landed in there. And so the first night it was very funny because we got in there late. And so we're like all prim and proper. Well, we're going to put our sleeping bags out and lie out there and whatever. It's going to be cool. Well, that lasted about five seconds. It was just infested with fire ants. Right? Oh, God. So we're like, this is impossible. And uh, Rusty goes, you know what? That's my plane. I'm sleeping in the plane, right? <laughs> I go, really? I go, yeah. And so we took the seats out of the plane, and he slept in the plane. I mean, he was the pilot. It was his pilot. Right. So I slept on the pontoons, half submerged. I mean, it was crazy. But anyway, <laughs> the next morning, early morning, I climbed to the top of Tofua, which is this active volcano. I was quite, I mean, this is crazy to do this. That I is crazy. Up, Having I, just been from the big island watching right. it blow up, I can have a very good sense of it. So we went to the top of it. it. It was blowing out these big, you know, cinder like tufa things. And it was like very hard and very hot. We got up there and it was like just crazy, you know, just looking down on this thing. And, and it was just sort of super, you know, like from another it's, world. Yeah, it's primordial. Yeah, I mean, it was. And it was just like so special and it was so hot, like sunstroke hot. Yeah. And of course, we didn't carry enough water. So going down, I remember, I'll remember the rest of my life, we were taking these big two foot boulders and shoving them down this you know, path. And it was like just crazy. But anyway, so we got back to the plane. 
And he goes, <laughs> I, and he goes I want to get out of here tonight. We can't take another night. It's just this, the fire ants, the centipedes, <laughs> the, you know, all that stuff. It's just intense. So we got off. And so it took us about two and a half hours to get enough lift to get over there. Because of the heat. Right, the heat. Yeah. And just we could not get above the, the top of the crater. But we finally did, and we cleared it by just like six feet or eight feet. And I threw my tanks out because we were heavy. Right? Yeah, so yeah, I threw yeah. my scuba tanks out. So then we went and we went and got fuel and hub high. But I mean, that is my claim to fame for being an explorer because yeah. I was the first one to ever summit Tofu. But it was interesting to me because as a boy, I was always fascinated by Cook and Bly and Mutiny in the Bounty and all that type of stuff. So it was a sort of boyhood dream. And was part of that also fueled by just the volcano itself that you wanted to be on an yeah, I mean, active volcano yeah, being well, living that, in Hawaii? Just because the fact of the, my original interest was that that's where Mutiny in the Bounty took place. And then I, no, I knew nobody had been up there, right? No, yeah. You know, it's like, oh my God. Yeah. At the time, I mean, I still have considered David Attenborough a close friend. And, you know, he had not even made it to the top. He's been up there since, I think. Yeah. But nobody had done it. So it's like, how many things do you do in life? That, like, exploration would be the first, you know, unless you want to go into space or something. Yeah, unless, yeah, it's almost impossible. You want to go down to the uh, bottom of these seas. I mean, there's not much left to explore on land. Wow. Yeah, well, it sounds like you deserve to be in the club. There's no Yeah, doubt. no, I love it. It's, it's super rarefied. And it's like, to hang out, it's just like, you know, I have to say, it's a room full of amazing egos, and rightly so, right? <laughs> so you have Elon Musk, or like, I was hanging out with Jeff Bezos this time, and I had a, a table, and I had a, you know astronaut at my table, and that's where I met Buzz Aldrin, and, you know, it's just like there's people yeah. bigger than life in my life, and I'm going, oh my God, you know? And there's so many women in the club that do amazing things, like Sylvia Earle, and it's just like amazing list of accomplishments. They're driven people right. that have similar aspirations, I think, as you do. Right. You know, you're just in a different field, and you chose a different path, but they're all kind of the same. Well, you know what it is? It's a sense of curiosity. That's what yeah, it is. I agree. Somebody doesn't have any curiosity. It's like, really? Right. Right. Yeah, no, I, I think we both share that. There's no doubt about it. The other thing we share is a booth in the, back in the... Uh, object show. Do you think we should go back and try to yeah. make money? Have we have we covered I, I, everything? I, know. I think we, we should make some money today. Actually, yeah. you know, yeah. we should trade back and forth. Well, I think one of the things that sets you apart, and me, I think as well, is that we're willing to put that aside. We have an opening, but we want to come back and talk, and we want to learn, and we want to hear what each other has to say. And um, you know, that's why we're, I think, probably both pretty good at our jobs. Yeah, well, it's been a great pleasure, and I'm glad you came to Honolulu. I'm glad I could show you and your oh, wife yeah. around. Yeah, and I'm glad you've sold me some things. And if anybody's in <laughs> Honolulu, Mark's got this great store. It's a fantastic store, and um, he's got incredible material. I can't say enough about what he has. He's one of the top dealers, if not the top dealer in this field, and um, he's worth knowing. All Thank right. you. Thanks, Mark. Mark, you're great. Thank All you. Right. All right.